namas. Such becoming is an instinctive capacity that humans have in common with animals. The very small child not only perceives the mother's feeling, he shares it. It's the basis of early animal and human learning. We take in and reproduce emotional reactions that are necessary for survival. The small creature learns what, it is to be, what is to be feared, what not, what is to be explored, what left alone, and so on. Psychoanalyst Joseph Sandler suggests that as adults too, we may at times be caught up in another's experience as if it were our own. He recounts walking on a crowded street in London along the edge of a pavement, when suddenly a man who was walking a yard or two in front of me slipped off the edge, slipped off the edge. I immediately righted myself, just as if I were about to stumble into the street, as if he, Sandler, were the person slipping. And I remember a five-year-old child at a fireworks display exclaiming to his friend after a spectacular series of rockets, look how I jump, look how I fall. He'd become the rocket himself. Sandler suggests that sympathy of this kind is the cement that binds human and perhaps animal societies together. The novelist J.M. Kutzi writes in his novel Elizabeth Costello, there's no limit to the extent to which we can think ourselves into the being of another. There are no bounds to the sympathetic imagination. My granddaughter, aged six, has for some years entered into the body and, atom, anim, and attitude of animals of all kinds. And this is part of her appreciation of their qualities and their be, of their ways of being and enters into her astounding drawings of them. And she said, oh, and when I failed to realize that she was being the toy cat that she'd just got, not talking to it, she said, as if to someone who understood nothing, that's the point of toys, she said, you bring them alive. Some people, of course, grow up with more skill in this area than others. Abraham Lincoln, according to his biographer, Doris Kearns Goodwin, possessed extraordinary empathy, the gift or curse of putting himself in the place of another to experience what they are feeling, to understand their motives and desires. For Lincoln, she suggests, this sensibility was a source of pain, a result of changing places in fancy with the sufferer. It was also an enormous asset to his political career. Listening to colleagues at a party caucus, he would cast off his shawl, rise from his chair and say, from your talk, I gather the Democrats will do so and so. I should do so and so, and thus checkmate them. We need to empathize with our opponents, even our enemies, not only in order to defeat them, but also to be able to move forward into relationships when we begin to negotiate with them. Now, I've talked for a long time, but this is the Petordi lecture, and I wanted to say a few things about the noob. This occasion itself makes me think of Ashish Nandi's great remark in the Tower of Cricket, that cricket is an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. And Tiger was an quintessentially Indian cricketer, as his adopted name, Tiger, implies. The image that comes back to the mind's eye, aquiline, still, slight, swift, hawkish, as we saw from some of those clips. Um, on the field, he had presence, a regal touch. One's eye would be drawn to him. Tiger was indeed something special, a proper arrogance, or as Bishan Bedi, whom we also heard there, put it, an imperious charm. He was laconic and understated, perhaps one might even say princely. He was, after all, a prince. He once convinced a team member that the Victoria Memorial here in Calcutta was another of his personal palaces. <laughs> when Tiger was asked after his maiden Test 100 in 1962 against Ted Dexter's MCC team, he was asked when he first believed he could 
play test cricket again after the injury, his reply was, when I first saw the England bowling. <laughs> Which reminds me of Mahatma Gandhi's response to the question put to him in 1933. What do you think of Western civilization, Mr. Gandhi? And he replied, I think it's a very good idea. <laughs> as a captain, as we heard again from Bishan, Patordi insisted on total commitment in the, in the field at a time when I would say fielding was not at the highest point of priority, especially amongst the Indian team. Betty said, on his debut, Betty's debut, he didn't, Patordi didn't have much to say about his bowling beyond acknowledging with a nod of his head that I was doing all right, but he had plenty to say about my fielding. Uh, which I could well understand to be true, despite his yoga, yogic exercises. And he also said, as he said on your clip, um, that he brought the Indian team together as a unit, rather than the group of individuals speaking different languages and sometimes forming cliques. In a way, Tiger was the Dennis Compton of Indian cricket, the first cricketing superstar in India whose appeal involves so heady a mix of brilliance, charm, and charisma. To top off the fairy story, he married Shamila Tagore, someone who in India's celluloid pantheon seems to me to have been a combination, if I may say so, of the great Shakespearean actress Peggy Ashcroft and Marilyn Monroe, with a bit of the opera diva Joan Sutherland and the prima ballerina, Margot Fontaine, thrown in for good measure. Aside from Tiger's aristocratic air, he also had the common touch. Peter Valance, who played with him for the village side in Sussex, Wisborough Green, where his guardian lived, his guardian in England lived, spoke to me of Tiger's approach approachability and of his pleasure in village green cricket. He once played for them on the Sunday in the middle of a county three-day match when he was playing for Sussex against Yorkshire at Hove. And indeed, I played against him at Wisborough Green when I was playing for the Middleton Sunday 11, Village 11. I was about 14 or 15. He was about 16 or 17. He was already rather famous. And I have to say that our combined tally of runs in that match was two and I outscored Patordi. <laughs> you can figure that one out. He was probably a bit of a rascal as well, Tiger. On a dry Indian Airways flight from Bombay to Calcutta, he invited John Woodcock and Henry Blofeld to the back of the plane to share a bottle of vintage brandy he'd quietly removed from the cellars of the palace at Bhopal. More notoriously, he got into trouble with a certain black buck. And the historian Ram Guha, who wrote the excellent book on Indian cricket, A Corner of a Foreign Field, told me how when they were both on, the TV, on a TV panel together shortly after the black buck affair, Tiger, surrounded by intellectuals of one kind or another, murmured that no doubt he'd, invite, he'd been invited onto the panel as the panel needed a convict to provide balance. By 1960, he was at Oxford, aged about what, 19, having played for Sussex for two years while at school. He'd scored two centuries in a match against Yorkshire with their full bowling attack, including Fred Truman. And county players spoke of him in hushed tones, hardened professionals, as a unique player. He had more than a touch of genius. And then, of course, the apparently innocuous accident happened on the seafront at Hove, near Brighton. Feeling no pain in his head or eye, he had no idea that a sliver of glass had entered his right eye. The operation left him with 90% sight uh, gone in the right eye. Only a few months later, he was playing for India with one and a bit eyes and scoring a century against that Dexter side in only his fourth test. 
There's a less known story about the eye injury. In 2001, years later, Saba Karim, a wicketkeeper batsman who played 35 times for India, was hit in the right eye whilst keeping wicket to Anil Kumble in an Asia Cup match in Dhaka. Tiger visited him in hospital, making his presence felt without shouting from the rooftops, Karim Sabah said. Sabah asked him how long it took him to recover. Sabah, he said, I never recovered. But Tiger made a life, including, of course, a major cricketing life, despite the accident. And he helped this younger man to accept fate and move on, to make the adjustments for his life to be worth living again. Tiger won the respect of cricketers everywhere. Ian Chappell again, who travelled from Sydney to Mumbai to speak in his honour a few month, months after his death, described his two innings in the Melbourne Test in 1967. Tiger had pulled a hamstring and missed the first test, which India lost. He played at Melbourne despite not being fully fit. India lost the toss. Oh, you won it just now. He'd lost the toss and were put into bat under heavy cloud on a green pitch. Pretty soon, they were 25 for five. Not altogether unknown in those days. All five to Garth McKenzie, who was quick and strong, a fine fast bowler at the top of his career. Patordi, who came in at six or seven, then scored 75, followed by 85 in the second innings. As Ian Chappell put it, not only was he batting on a green pitch in bowler-friendly conditions, not only was he coming in at 25 for five after being put into bat with one of the leading fast bowlers of his time against him, not only did he have only one fit eye, he had only one fit leg as well. And Chappell remembered, remembered two shots during that first innings, a hook that went in front of square for a one bounce four on the biggest square boundary in world cricket and a back foot straight drive off Mackenzie over mid on for another one bounce four. And I'll end with Ian's story again. He asked Tiger after, he tr after they both retired what Tiger did after retirement and the reply play again, I don't really do anything. No, said Ian. What do you do for a job? Now you're not playing cricket. What do you do from nine to five? I don't do anything in particular, said Tiger. I'm a prince. We don't know much about princes in Australia, said Chapel. So what do you actually do? Ian, said Tiger, I'm a bloody prince. Thank you very much for your attention.